Hello. On behalf, <laughs> on behalf of the Shawnee County K-State Research and Extension Office, welcome. We are so excited for the second webinar in our Planting Wild series. This garden is for the birds. Creating a bird-friendly landscape presented by our Shawnee County Master Gardener, Kevin Seek. Before I turn it over to Kevin, I'd like to ask, hi Kevin. Hi. I'd like to ask that all the participants turn off their microphones and video cameras for the duration of the presentation. If you have any questions at all, feel free to type them in the chat box where I can relay them to Kevin, or once the presentation has concluded, we can all turn on our mics and or our cameras back on and have a little discussion. We will be recording today's webinar. Later this week, the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel on our website, and we will email a copy to our registered participants along with a very short survey. Please take the time for our two-minute survey. It helps us continue to provide quality programming for our community. All right, well, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Shawnee County Master Gardener, Kevin C. All right, let's get this party started here. Pull up my, share my screen, slideshow. All right. Can you see it okay? All right. Um, well, hey, welcome everybody. I'm glad that you decided to check out uh, today's presentation on creating a bird friendly environment in your home landscape. And uh, I'm Kevin Seek, I'm a Shawnee County Master Gardener. I need to begin by letting you know that K State and uh, the Research and Extension programs and materials are uh, there for everybody. We don't discriminate. We try and be as inclusive as we can because we want to get to lots of good information about gardening out there to everybody in the community. Um, so what, what am I going to be talking about today? Well, first, let me just say a few words about what Master Gardeners do. We, um, we share loads of information throughout the year about gardening with their community through all kinds of venues like these webinars and our garden response line that's open now to answer your gardening questions um, when we're able to get out and meet people face to face we do uh, programs at the library and we always have a booth at the farmers market we have um, a whole lot of demonstration gardens all around Topeka and we do just tons of educational uh, programs to help educate the public about gardening with research-based information from K-State. Um, so today uh, the aim of my presentation is to provide you with the information you'll need to begin to create a bird friendly habitat in your home landscape. And uh, before we get the ball rolling here, one more disclaimer, this presentation contains copyrighted material, the use of which hasn't been specifically authorized by the copyright holders. But since it's entirely being used for nonprofit educational purposes, we feel it's a fair use uh, through the Copyright Act. So, Let's kick it off by talking about why would you even want to um, attract birds to your garden? What are the benefits? Well, for one thing, birds aid in pollination and seed dispersal. Uh, most people, when they think about how birds uh, contribute to uh, plant reproduction, they think about the fascinating little hummingbird, you know, drinking nectar out of uh, your flowers. But really, all birds contribute in some way um, just by their movement through uh, the environment and the accessing their food sources and things. Uh, all birds contribute to some degree in plant reproduction. Um, yeah, um, and so many plants, as, or as a matter of fact, rely 
to a great extent and really probably couldn't survive without the symbiotic relationship they have with birds. A good example is this uh, white bark pine and the Clark's Nutcracker. The Clark's Nutcracker gets those pine nuts and then the ones that he doesn't eat right away, he buries them just like a squirrel. And then the ones that they don't go and dig up to eat, uh, sprout and grow new white bark pine trees. Um, without that, there wouldn't be nearly as many white bark pine trees. Um, birds eat lots of bugs. Um, many birds are insectivores or primarily eat insects. Uh, so, and many of them eat a lot of insect pests that we're happy to get rid of like mosquitoes and aphids and grubs and borers and so on. But they eat other pests like slugs and snails. And, um, you know, here's an example. The barn swallow uh, can eat uh, 850 insects a day and many of those are mosquitoes. Um, but one thing to bear in mind is that birds uh, aren't that picky about the insects they eat. So when you're designing your uh, bird-friendly habitat, you're going to be want to be sure and provide the proper cover to protect those uh, pollinator insects, which we'll discuss in, in a little more detail further on. Um, a lot of people don't realize how much birds help with weed control. Um, there, as you can see from this slide, there's all different kinds of birds that eat weed seeds and a wide variety of annual weed seeds that we're more than happy to have them eat so those weeds aren't reproducing in our home landscape. And just one example is the um, little American tree sparrow here, which is uh, a tree sparrow you see, you know, all over Kansas. And uh, in the state of Iowa, they did this study where they found that over the course of just one winter, the tree sparrows in Iowa uh, ate 875, almost 900 tons of weed seeds just over the course of one winter. Um, but one reason why I think uh, having a bird-friendly garden is important uh, is because you're going to be contributing to environmental and wildlife conservation. Birds in North America and the United States are, are having a hard time right now. Um, a recent study found that overall birds in uh, the U.S. have uh, decreased by um, what is it, 3 billion fewer birds now than there were in 1970, which is like one in four birds that have disappeared. And our grassland birds have been, have been more heavily impacted than that. Uh, one example is the Eastern Meadowlark, which is closely related to, and looks very much like our state bird, the Western Meadowlark. Their population's down over 50%. The Western Meadowlark, not quite as much, but still that's been heavily impacted. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the loss and fragmentation of habitat and overuse of pesticides. Um, so when you're creating your landscape and you're use, utilizing the native plants that grow in our region, you're helping the environment because um, you're uh, helping to replace vanishing bird habitat and native plants uh, take a lot less resources um, than other commercial cultivars. Um, so your bird friendly garden is going to help sow another little patch in the crazy quilt of the fragmented, fragmented habitat that's out there and could even help create what they call wildlife corridors where these fragmented habitats become connected and so it actually kind of creates a broader space for birds and wildlife to move about and thrive. And then another thing that's really important right now while we're dealing with uh, this uh, pandemic crisis and everybody is bound to be stressed out is 
hanging out with birds is really good for your mental health. It helps to reduce depression and anxiety and stress. It, it can even help with your memory. And then of course, uh, you know, we all know what great exercise working out in our garden is. So there's some reasons why I think you might want to uh, start making a bird friendly uh, landscape in your yard. And now let's talk about some of the fundamental design principles you're going to put into practice when you're creating your bird friendly landscape. So first of all, probably foremost, is you want to let nature be your guide. Um, look around at the natural environment around you and then try and mimic that to the extent that you can in your home landscape, uh, you know, as far as it is compatible with uh, whatever your preferred gardening style may be. I mean, my home yard, my like my backyard is kind of a little urban wildlife sanctuary, but some people like a more formal looking garden. Well, you can still garden uh, that way, but you want to, use this principle of creating layers in your environment. So in other words, just like in the natural environment, you have your overstory trees and then under them are the understory trees. Uh, so your big tr shade trees like a mulberry or oak tree. And then underneath that, you're gonna see, um, you know, like some choke cherry or uh, pawpaw. Uh, red buds and then down to shrubs like uh, service berry or elderberry and vine burnum and on down to smaller forbs and vines and ground covers even down to the root system in the ground because that's going to help support like uh, uh, grubs and worms and things that your birds are going to want to eat. So bear that in mind when you get begin to designing your bird friendly habitat. Uh, native plants are really a good thing to include. Um, you know, I'm not a native plant purist. I'm not trying to tell you that you have to go completely native, but the more you focus on native plants, um, the better success you're going to have. Uh, attracting birds to your garden because those are the plants that they recognize out there uh, that they're used to being around that provide cover and food sources and so on. But also native plants, uh, because they're, they naturally grow here, are going to have less water requirements, they're going to be more pest resistant and so on. Um, so I really encourage you to investigate um, native plants that you can incorporate into your garden. There's lots of beautiful native plants. I mean, here's just a few examples right here. And, um, and at the end of my presentation, I'll have some resources where you can um, research and find, you know, buy native plants around here. And uh, birds like eating those native plants. Um, um, so, you know, birds eat all different kinds of things, fruit and nuts and berries and native grasses and um, uh, wildflower seeds, nectar. So you need to make sure that you have a diverse uh, planting of um, things that are going to provide a variety of food sources for the very all the different birds that you're trying to attract to your yard to your garden. Um, another principle to um, bear in mind is uh, planting stuff in clumps uh, or you know another term you'll hear a lot of times is planting it masses or drifts um, but basically the idea is that you're not just planting one little specimen plant there by itself, you're planting a group of the same plants all together. And that's important for a number of reasons. Uh, 
if for one thing, it kind of gives the landscape a little more natural appearance and it can be very attractive, just as you can see from the pictures I've included there. Um, but a lot of plants aren't self-pollinating, so they need a lot of their brothers and sisters around to help uh, carry on the pollination process so they can bear seed and so on. Um, and also by putting stuff in clumps, it makes it easier for the birds to find that food source or uh, that kind of cover, uh, likewise with pollinators. And as I talked about before, providing cover for pollinators, this is a way that, so instead of just planting one lonely little milkweed plant, you plant a clump of milkweed plants, and then that way the little monarch caterpillars that are feeding on there, if some birds come by to try and eat them, they can drop down into that plant cover and find protection in there. So, uh, you know, we don't mind sacrificing a few monarch caterpillars to our birds, but, you know, we, we don't want them to eat them all. Um, Living on the edge. So now I'm going to talk about another principle. It's a um, the scientific term is a ecotone, and an ecotone is simply just a region where one or where two or more different habitats come together, like the ed the edge of a forest by a meadow, um, you know, or it could be. Uh, uh, woods growing on along a river bank, uh, but a lot of birds and wildlife thrive in these ecotone regions because they're able to access elements from both those habitats that they utilize in their particular lifestyle. In fact, some like this, the beautiful indigo bunting there, they live exclusively within that ecotone region, um, and. So including ecotones is important because it's a very attractive habitat for a lot of birds. And so you'll be attracting a lot bigger variety of birds to your yard. Uh, of course, it also is an attractive uh, habitat for other wildlife, some of which may be predators of our little feathered friends. So, uh, you know, again, it goes back to that layered principle to where you're creating cover within that ecotone so the birds have a place to go to escape from the predator species. Um, including a few evergreens is always a good idea. Evergreens um, are a preferred nesting and roosting uh, uh, locations for a lot of birds and they're a really good uh, food source uh, because a lot of uh, evergreens uh, like uh, juniper berries and pine cone seeds uh, persist into the winter months when it's a little harder for um, our birds to forage for food. Um, keeping a little dead wood in your landscape is very beneficial. I know probably if you have friends that are arborists out there, they they might frown on it. But, um, you know, having a few snags and, uh, um, well, for example, in my yard, I have um, some trees that I keep nicely pruned and just like a, a, you know, an arborist would like. But I got in one corner of my yard is this ratty old uh, silver maple that, you know, is not was not the healthiest tree ever to begin with and it's got some broken branches and some dead snags up there and so that's my little location where I leave some dead wood for um, you know uh, birds uh, I mean uh, woodpeckers and other cavity nesting birds to nest in uh, that dead wood especially dead logs um, are home to a lot of uh, insects that birds like to eat. And so, um, you know, this uh, snag in this picture is one that's in my, my neighbor's tree, 
but I enjoy a lot of birds that come from that, that snag. There's a family of flickers that live there that come to my feeding station in my backyard all the time. Every day I see them when I'm looking out my kitchen window. Uh, but one thing that's important to remember is it, the, especially for snags, you know, you don't want to have them located where they could potentially uh, drop on uh, a walkway or your house or something. You know, tonight if we're they're talking 50 mile an hour winds. Well, you don't want a big old dead snag like that next to your house where it could fall and bust through your roof. So just bear that in mind. Vines are another great thing to have. A lot of birds, especially smaller birds, utilize vines for cover and, you know, because uh, the smaller birds can perch on the, the vines, whereas a heavier bird, you know, can't uh, balance on, the, on something that flexible. And so it's a good place for them to perch and find food and lots of birds like to nest in vines. Um, and many vines are another source of food that like bittersweet and Virginia creeper um, will hold their uh, berries into the fall and winter to provide that uh, food during a kind of a scarce time of year. Uh, okay, lawns. First of all, let me say I do have a lawn but it's a small lawn and um, um, and then a big part of uh, particularly in my backyard what I'm looking at is how can I convert that traditional monoculture lawn into something that's going to be a more attractive habitat for my birds and uh, as my graphic shows here lawns use a tremendous amount of resources uh, water in particular, um, that, uh, you know, we could be conserving that if we were a little wiser about what we planted. Um, but then also, the most people in their lawn care regimen includes applying pesticides, fertilizer. Fertilizer can be a problem. If it's over applied, then it uh, Leap, uh, you know, escapes out into the environment and can cause water pollution. Uh, pesticides are, can be a problem for birds. I'll talk about that a little more later on. But uh, there's many alternatives to just the traditional lawn. Like I said, my, my wife really likes uh, to have a little bit of lawn. So I have a small cool season lawn out front, but it's surrounded by a uh, wildflower border um, and uh, part of that is my pollinator garden. And uh, but like I said, in my backyard, I'm looking at uh, investigating how I might replace that with like some native sedges that are a grass-like plant, but they take a lot less care. They can tolerate more shade than uh, just the traditional turf grass. So I recommend that uh, you explore these alternatives to the traditional lawn and you'll help create, you'll help the environment and you'll also help create more space for your birds to hang out. Um, okay, invasives can be a big problem if they're not controlled. Um, invasives are non-native species that generally have been introduced into our environment by other humans like us that at the time they thought it was a good idea because they didn't realize at the time, the undesirable characteristics that were going to show up once these plants and animals became prevalent in the environment. And, uh, and uh, you know, they're not necessarily a, a big problem until the populations blossom to the point where they begin to outcompete the our more desirable native uh, animal and plant species. And then they can be a problem and can be very disruptive uh, to our ecosystem and are a threat to our natural species diversity. Uh, you know, a good example is I have this ongoing war with this uh, Asian book, bush honeysuckle. Uh, but you know, after battling it for a couple of years, I'm finally getting the upper hand on it. Um, 
how sparrows and starlings are probably the most obvious uh, invasive bird problems. And uh, as I said, if they're not controlled or removed from uh, the environment, then they can become a problem. Those invasive birds can easily displace the, the native birds you're trying to attract. Both house sparrows and starlings are very aggressive birds and they'll chase other birds out of their nests and uh, you know chase them away from your feeding stations and so on. But there's a number of different ways that you can control them. Sometimes it's just a matter of not putting out uh, the kind of seed that they like to eat. Like house sparrows love white millet. So if you don't put white millet out, they're probably not gonna hang around your feeding station too much. But I mean, if it's a severe problem, you may need to take more, um, uh, you know, severe measures to control them. But uh, if you have any trouble with invasive uh, plant species, uh, I recommend you contact the Extension Art Office and we can uh, tell you the recommended course of action for dealing with whatever plant you're having a problem with. And the K-State Extension Animal Control website has all kinds of good information about controlling nuisance animals and, and particularly about and controlling invasive species or you can contact the Extension Office too, and you know we can we can help you out there too. Um, pesticides, as I started talking about before, when we we're talking about lawns, pesticides. Pesticides can be a useful tool, but they need to be used judiciously because uh, uh, a pesticide um, doesn't have a mind of its own. It's not gonna be particular about what uh, type of animal or plant vector it's um, affecting. And so we need to be careful when we use pesticides because they can be a severe threat to birds. They can act, kill birds directly. They can contaminate their food sources. Uh, some of them persist in the environment and, and pose an ongoing threat to birds. I mean, probably the most, uh, famous uh, historically is uh, the problem that we had uh, with DDT and our bald eagle populations. Um, so um, what I recommend is that you learn about a technique called integrated pest management and uh, which is a way of managing um, pest problems in your garden without having to overuse pesticides. And so as you can see from this IPM pyramid, it starts with prevention and then, you know, using good cultural and sanitation practices, physically removing the problem, biological controls on up to the pinnacle, which is the last resort of using pesticide. And I'm going to read you here quickly this definition from the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources that kind of describes integrated pest management, which they say is an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests or their da damage through a combination of techniques such as biological control, habitat manipulation, modification of cultural practices, and use of resistant varieties. Pesticides are used only after monitoring indicates they are needed and treatments are made with the goal of removing only the target organism. Pest control materials are selected and applied in a manner that minimizes risk to human health, beneficial and non-target organisms and the environment. And um, if you wanna know more about integrated pest management, I highly recommend a webinar from uh, the last series that we did that our uh, horticulture agent Ariel did that has really great information about explaining integrated pest management and how to implement it in your home garden. Um, and then I would need to talk for a minute about domestic cats. Um, and let me start by saying that I don't hate cats. Uh, I used to have pet cats of my own. I think cats uh, make great pets, but pet cats have their place. And 
outdoor cats, and in particular feral cats, feral domestic cats, are a big threat to birds. Um, they kill uh, literally billions of birds and uh, other wildlife in our um, urban environment every year. And, um, but beyond that, for you cat lovers out there, there's many studies that show that indoor cats live longer and healthier lives. Uh, for one thing, they're less exposed to predators that they might encounter when they're out roaming around outside. Uh, but most importantly, they're not exposed to a lot of feline diseases that they can tr contract when they're outside. Like probably the most prevalent one is feline leukemia, which, you know, if your cat gets that, it's not a good thing. And they can also uh, pick up diseases they can transmit to their uh, masters too. Um, but so, you know, for the sake of our birds and wildlife and for your pet, I recommend that you keep your cat indoors or if it's going to be outside, you know, keep an eye on it or keep it restrained so you're making sure that it's not, uh, you know, killing the, your feathered friends. And if you have feral cats in your neighborhood, the animal control can come out and help uh, capture them and remove them from your neighborhood. And there are feral or what they call community cat rescue organizations in the city that um, like Topeka Cat Association and Topeka Community Cat Fix that will go out and get those feral cats and um, and they don't use euthanize them. They have what's called a trap, neuter, and return program where they trap them, they neuter them, they vaccinate them so they won't get sick, and then they return them back to the wild, and then those cats are no longer able to produce more feral cats. But So that cat is still out there preying on birds, but at least it's a way to help diminish that um, population of feral cats. Um, so Leslie, have we had any questions come in that I need to respond to? No questions from the chat box. Ariel would like to thank you for the plug and she oh. her uh, a link to her webinar in the chat box. Okay, and then right. Carolyn Seals um, wanted to give a little caution about vines. They can be tricky to maintain control. Even Virginia creeper can take over if you aren't careful. Well, right, and there are some vine, like a trumpet vine is one that, it's a lovely vine and uh, can be a good resource for birds, but if you plant it, you got to be very watchful because it can quickly become invasive if it has, uh, you know, ideal growing conditions. So that's a good comment, Carolyn. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the fundamental elements that birds need to be able to thrive in that environment that you're creating for them. So birds, just like all wildlife, have four critical things that they need to survive. Food, water, shelter, uh, or cover, and then um, safe places to rear their young. So in case of birds, it's uh, good uh, safe nesting sites. And it's important that you provide all four of them uh, for the birds to be able to, um, you know, thrive and exist in your garden. So first, let's start with food. Like we talked about before, birds eat a variety of stuff, insects, seeds, nuts, nectar, fruit. Um, and so you want to be sure and choose a variety of uh, foods and, a vari and provide a variety um, that's going to be available throughout the different seasons. You know, birds have different food requirements as the seasons change. Uh, you know, earlier this spring and, uh, and right now, birds uh, have a big demand for food because they're raising a new family. And uh, so they've got to find food for their young to eat. Um, you know, later in the fall, migratory birds or even birds that are vagrants that are moving uh, you know, out of their breeding range here uh, to uh, their overwintering range. Um, 
are going to need foods that are high in fat to get the energy they need to make their journeys. Birds that stick around over the winter are going to need to find uh, food sources that are still persisting in the environment after a lot of uh, our plants have gone dormant for the season. Uh, so bear that in mind. Um, Project Feeder Watch uh, is a great resource. Their uh, program uh, with the Cornell Ornithology Lab, and uh, I recommend you go check them out. They can give you all kinds of good information about uh, what the things that birds like to eat, and also about uh, uh, providing supplemental food sources for birds as well. Uh, Oh, what the hell, get out of there. Um, and so let's just talk about supplemental food sources. Um, so that's another great way to provide food th for your birds throughout the year. But it's also a great way to be able to observe the birds and uh, you know all the interesting things that, that birds do in the course of their busy day. Um, you know, this uh, picture of my feeding station that I have that I can see right out my kitchen window. And so I spend a lot of time uh, watching the birds uh, out there. But um, you want to have uh, different types of feeders at different heights because birds have different feeding requirements. Uh, some birds, like, uh, you know, morning doves uh, love to, and then over the winter, the juncos love to feed on that little platform feeder near the ground. Um, other birds like, um, oh, um, like robins and cardinals and other birds like that, like a feeding station that's a little higher up. A lot of songbirds like one, a feeding station that's a little higher up where they have a good view of the environment around them. And then of course I have a soot feeder for all those birds that are more uh, on the insectivore side, like uh, the flickers I was talking about. There's one sitting on top of the soot feeder. And, uh, but I get lots of woodpeckers and nut hatches and so on, chickadees. Um, you can't go wrong with a hummingbird feeder. I mean, you can spend endless hours of enjoyment watching those little hummers and, you know, they're just a wonder of nature that I never get tired of watching. Um, you know, also you can put out uh, like uh, these other, um, like fruit uh, feeders for Orioles. Uh, I have a, uh, a uh, feeder for my bluebirds that contains, um, mealworms that they like to eat. So, but you can investigate uh, further and decide, uh, oh, um, what it is, uh, you know, the birds that you really want to attract, you can tailor your supplemental feeding sources to that way. Make sure you get good quality feed that doesn't have filler seed. Like around here, a lot of cheap mixes will have a lot of milo in it. Well, birds don't really like milo that much. And so, the, the, you know, they go after the more beneficial seeds. So they just pick those milo seeds out of there. And so, um, you know, it's a waste of seed unless you're trying to grow a little milo plot underneath your bird feeder. Um, otherwise, you probably don't want that kind of feed. Uh, and then the other thing is you want to provide some cover near your uh, feeding station about 15 feet away. That way it's far enough away that predators can't just spring unawares on the birds while they're feeding, but if a predator shows up like a cooper's hawk or something, they can quickly fly over there and get to cover and get a, uh, escape those predators. Water, of course, you know, birds need water to drink, but aquatic birds uh, use it as cover. It can be a food source for a lot of birds. And, but the more water you, sources you have in your yard, the better. Um, you know, uh, even a little rain garden or a swell that temporarily catches uh, rainwater is a beneficial addition. Uh, you know, if you have a pond, it's a good idea to let some uh, plants grow up along the edge to provide that cover that we talked about just a minute ago. Uh, you know, supplemental water sources. Um, I mean, just a simple bird bath can be a great supplemental 
water source. Uh, you know, if you're a little more ambitious, you can install a fountain. Um, you know, I have drippers over my bird feeders, uh, like in this picture here. That's an old uh, sun tea jar that I had that started leaking. So I just repurposed it into a dripper. I fill that up with water and that drips into that, uh, that uh, bird bath there. And it, uh, the, the sound and movement of that dripping water actually helps attract the birds to that water source. And, um, and it helps keep the bird bath uh, full of water longer. And uh, that robin that's sitting on there for a while, it's like he was out there every day splashing around in that bird bath. And that dripper came in handy because he'd really splash around and splash a lot of water out of there. Um, and again, provide some cover, um, you know, to keep him safe. Um, shelter, uh, very important. And as we talked about before, you want to provide a variety of different types of um, cover for your birds. And uh, so you want to select, select, select your plants that are going to provide maximum shelter for the birds in your garden. Hedges and evergreens uh, that are planted as a wind block can be important if uh, you have a lot of open area in your garden, you know, particularly in the winter, winter when we get that cold north wind. And if you're just beginning to create your bird-friendly habitat and want to add a little more cover, um, you know, a brush pile like that one back there in the corner, um, or a, a, a stack of firewood, a pile of rocks, or a loosely stacked stone wall are all good ways to provide some supplemental cover for birds. And of course, nesting sites, you know, if birds are going to reproduce, they got to have good nesting sites. And if you want them to nest in your yard, uh, then you want to provide uh, the, some a variety of attractive nest sites for your birds. And another program that uh, uh, Cornell Ornithology Lab has is this Project Nest Watch, and which is really cool. You can go on there and people take pictures um, you know, of birds that are nesting in their yard. So you can go and like look, uh, like pictures that people have taken right in our area of birds that they've been watching in their nests. But it also has great information about nesting requirements for birds. It's even got information on your different backyard birds of like what type of a nest box they prefer and plans of how to build one. Um, and so talking about nesting boxes, that's another great way to provide, uh, you know, additional nesting sites for your birds. Now, if you put out nest boxes and you make sure you're putting them in the proper location and everything, and you aren't seeing birds moving in, uh, you know, don't get real discouraged because like in my yard, I have some nest boxes I put up. I've never had birds move into them, but that's because they found enough natural nest sites out there that they don't need to use them. And the reason I know that is because at my feeding station, like especially this spring, at my feeding station, I see all these families of birds coming in, feeding at my feeder after their young ones have fledged. So I know I have a lot of birds out there nesting in my yard. They're just not using those boxes. But I do have a family of bluebirds nesting out there and I've been loving watching them. Um, but um, you know, you need to make sure that uh, predators can't get into those nest boxes and you want to make sure to clean them out every season uh, so that they're ready for a new family of birds to move in in the spring. And talking about cleaning too, that's another important thing with your feeding stations. You want to keep those feeders clean yeah, you know, about once a year, clean them out because you don't want any like moldy seed to accumulate in there. It can spread disease to your birds and you don't want your birds to get sick, you know, just coming to your feeders. And if you do all of those things, I think you're going to be pretty happy with the results. And um, so I just want to wrap things up here by um, just sharing another quote from the famous naturalist uh, and uh, avid 
birder and famous uh, nature essayist John Burroughs, he famously said that the smallest deed is better than the greatest intention. So if you have an intention of creating a bird friendly habitat in your garden at home, um, even if you do a little bit, like putting up a hummingbird feeder or just planting a few plants that are going to be attractive to birds or putting out a few nesting boxes, you're doing that much more to help replace that vanishing bird habitat. And like I said, if you follow the recommendations in this uh, presentation, I have no doubt that you'll soon be enjoying many happy hours communing with birds and nature, and you'll be making a great contribution to creating a sustainable environment for birds and wildlife and us. So thank you for listening and I hope that this information was useful to you all. Um, here's a few resources that I'd like to share with you. The first three are places where you can go to find out everything you ever wanted to know about birds. The next two are some K-State Extension publications uh, that'll help you choose plants that you might want to include in your garden. And then the rest of them are all resources where you can learn more about um, native plants that'll grow well in our region and um, also um, some local um, vendors where you can go and purchase those plants. And that's all I have uh, to share if there's any questions. I have a question in the chat box here from yeah. Beth Cunningham. She had a flock of cedar wax wings clean out all of the hollies in their yard. Then, <laughs> yeah. then they moved to the berries on the tall Nandinas. And she read that the Nandina berry could be poisonous. Are those poisonous berries to birds? Well, I'm not familiar with the Medina berry. Nandina uh, with an N. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. But if the um, cedar wax wings ate a bunch of them and they didn't seem to have any adverse effects of, from it, then I wouldn't be too concerned about it. Um, uh, cedar wax wings are pretty tough little birds. You know, something that's funny about cedar wax wings is that they they love to eat uh, crab apples, and I've seen a couple times where, like crab apples that held their the crab apples over the winter. In the spring, the crab apples kind of start to ferment and get a little bit of alcohol content in them, and then the cedar wax wings show up and start eating them, and they they start acting kind of nutty because they get a little bit drunk off of eating those, those crab apples. It's kind of funny to watch. But yeah, I mean, if the birds ate the seeds and they didn't suffer any ill effects, then it's, it's probably not something that is going to harm them. But, you know, I mean, it might not, it wouldn't do any harm to research them a little bit to just make sure they're not toxic, like if you have pets around, um, you know, because there's some plants that may have fruit that would be toxic to like a dog or a cat, but isn't going to bother a bird. Any other questions? Um, well, I would love to invite everybody to turn on their videos and their microphones if they'd like to. We could have a little discussion. Um, Melissa, she shared and she said, all morning I've been watching a female cardinal build a nest in the lilac bush under my kitchen window. Proud Papa watches nearby. I can't wait to see their little family. Oh yeah, that's great. Yeah, we used to have this rose bush right outside our bedroom window and one year a uh, cardinal family built their nest in there and so we could sit at, they built it at the back of the 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 rose bush so we could see them from inside the house and so we were just able to lay there in bed and watch them do their thing but the thing is in this you know cardinals 
they're the first birds up in the morning and the first ones to go to bed at night. And so, and you know, they love to sing loud. And uh, so it's like, oh yeah, man, those cardinals, they get up early, you know, get up at, before the sunrise and be out there singing away and waking us up every spring in the spring, uh, particularly when we had our windows open. But it was well worth it to be able to watch them and watch the little ones hatch and fledge and everything. Yeah, well, great. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, Ariel looks like she found an Audubon, an Audubon news story about the Nandina. Oh, uh-huh. Um, as a good resource for um, Becky to start looking. And it looks okay. like yeah, there is some toxicity between Nandina and the um, wa cedar waxwing. And then really? Hmm. Well, I'm going to have to go check that out now. Yeah. Yeah. If it's Red um, Audubon Society, they know what they're talking about. And then Melissa asks, Kevin, do you have any bird seed brands that you would like to recommend? Well, I tell you, the brand isn't so important as what is in the bag. And that's what you want to do is look at the bag and make sure it doesn't have those filler seed like I was talking about. Like millet is one. Um, ones that have a lot of, or I mean, yeah, uh, like uh, have a lot of like white millet, white or red millet, or have a lot of uh, Milo in particular. You know, like I said before, birds, uh, they, that uh, Milo is a low quality seed when, uh, as far as birds are concerned. And so they're going to just pick those out and eat the seeds that they prefer. Um, you know, and there are, uh, birds that like to eat millet but you know I mean the things that you and uh, but also like I said I mean that white millet will attract house sparrows too so it can become a problem if you have a high millet content in your in your seed but uh, you know you can't go wrong with black oil sunflower seed um, you know I put out a lot of black oil and safflower seed as one that, uh, you know, birds with a heavier beak like a cardinal and your finches, they will, you know, just uh, chow down on that safflower seed. But other birds with a weaker beak like a starling or house sparrow can't crack those seeds, so they don't eat them. Uh, so those are two good ones to put out, um, you know, um, soot. Uh, is also a good thing to put out there. And um, if you can make your own soot, it's a little better quality than what you're going to buy in the store. And it's pretty easy to make. Um, but yeah, but I mean, that's the thing that the brand isn't so important as the content. So you want to read the label and make sure it doesn't have a lot of those uh, um, undesirable seeds in there. And then, you know, and then I would just pick the one that's the most economical. That's great. And then um, Deanna would like to know where you found your Backyard Birds of Kansas poster. Oh, I just found it online. Um, let's see. Um, oh, God. Now I'm trying to think. Uh, where you can get that but you know i'll tell you what if you just google backyard birds of kansas and then click on images it'll pop up there and then you can go to that website and find it that way um, and then carolyn seals has a little tidbit about the nandina berries she says they can be controlled by cutting off the white flowers before they create the berries uh -huh. and Apparently, there are sterile, sterile forms of Nandina as well that wouldn't vary at all. Uh-huh, right. Nandina, that's not something I'm familiar with, so. Um. Okay, great. Well, before we wrap things up, I want to put in one last plug for the Master Garden Gardener program. And I encourage all of you, if you love to garden and have some time to volunteer, you ought to check out the Master Gardener program. 
Uh, we have all a myriad variety of volunteer opportunities that you can take part in from our demonstration gardens to help and grow plants in our greenhouse for our annual plant sale fundraiser and our different awareness programs that we do, educational programs. And um, But if you love to garden and you love to visit with other people about gardening, you will have a lot of fun as a master gardener. If there's some aspect of gardening that you don't know much about that you'd like to know more about I guarantee you there's someone in our group that can tell you all about whatever that is that you're going to find more about you know I love being a master gardener because it's probably the one place I can go and I can just talk and talk and talk about gardening and people don't like look at me with that blank stare like is he ever going to shut up about this gardening stuff no, you don't have to worry about that with master gardeners. But, uh, you know, I, um, I think things will be a little bit different this year because of the, you know, COVID precautions and stuff. But, um, uh, you know, generally the interviews are in August and then classes begin in September and run for, I believe, six weeks. And you'll learn all about gardening and, and uh you'll be all ready to start off on your path to being a full-fledged master gardener. So I encourage you to check it out. And if you need to get a hold of uh, Shawnee County uh, Extension Master Gardeners, there's our contact information. And thank you all for um, participating in today's webinar. Oh, Kevin, we're so lucky to have you. Um, <laughs> two, more, two more questions sprouted up. Okay. One of them was, how do you control seeds sprouting under your bird feeders? Oh, seed sprouting? Um, well, um, <laughs> yeah, I guess that can be an issue sometimes. Um, but um, I mean, the main thing is providing good quality feed, right? Because a lot of times those seeds that are spread, just like I was talking about growing a Milo field under your feeder, right? A lot of times those, those seeds that are sprouting down there are the ones, they're there because the birds aren't eating them. So, I mean, that's one thing is look and see what it is that's sprouting down there and then maybe eliminate that from your mix. Um, you know, but uh, I don't really have a problem with that because I have that uh, platform feeder and so the seed that drops out of those feeders above fall into that platform feeder. And, uh, you know, I just monitor that platform feeder. And when the seed's almost gone out of there, I dump it out. And, um, but, um, you yeah, know. Carolyn Seal says since I use sunflower seeds, I just let them grow. Yeah, that's not going to hurt anything. You know, now I did, I'll tell you what, I did have a problem at some, the, one of my feeders that was over by my, uh, by our bedroom, and I had this tube feeder, and for a while I was putting a mixture, a uh, blend of sunflower chips and those Niger thistle seeds, which the Niger seeds, like goldfinches, love that. But some of the other finches really don't care for them. And so they were just picking them out. And so it ended up, I'd end up with all this um, thistle seed on the ground and the, um, you know, that they would just pick out. And which um, nowadays, niger seed, it, it's sterile. And so you don't have to worry about it sprouting. But I had the, you know, before long, I had this thick mat of this, thistle seed down there that started to mold and stuff and uh, I had to get it out of there because it actually one of my little finches picked up some kind of a you know disease from that moldy seed down there so you know that's one thing I mean if you got seed collecting under your feeders you want to get I mean besides cleaning your feeders out you don't want to let a lot of that seed collect under there and get moldy and stuff you know just rake it up and get it out of there but uh, but I mean that's you know if you have seed collecting under there that tells you it's seed that the birds aren't eating right 
because even seed that drops out of the feeder, there's plenty of ground feeding birds that are gonna pick it up off the ground to eat it if it's something they wanna eat. Hi, Barb, do you have a question? Well, I sort of do, but I'm sort of embarrassed to ask it. Um, you know, we have um, Cleveland pear trees and Bradford pear trees in our neighborhood. And I realized, I think somebody said they were imported from Asia, but the birds never, and there are all kinds of berries on those trees, but the birds never eat them. And is that, What's wrong with those birds? <laughs> why, well, why wouldn't they think that, that, uh, that these would be really tasty? But I have never seen a bird eat them. Right. I have some ornamental pears right out in my front yard that are right next to one of my feeding stations. They never eat the berries off them because they don't have uh, good nutritional value for them. You know, okay. so... Uh, you know, it's like initially they might eat a few and they're just like, you know, but they're not satisfying their diet. So they're like, oh, you know, there's plenty of other good stuff to eat around here. So that's kind of goes back to, you know, why you want to plant native plants, yeah. um, you know, and uh, I mean, because those ornamental pears, they've gone through a lot of breeding. And so, you know, they've been bred for, um, their shape and their appearance and, uh, you know, for their look and not for their food value, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that a lot of, with a lot of the commercial cultivars, it's that way as uh, they look nice, but they're not providing a lot of resources for birds and okay. wildlife. Okay. And likewise with your pollinators, you know, some, because uh, pollinators, they see a different light spectrum than us, right? So they can see like into the uh, ultraviolet. And so sometimes, you know, a flower from a cultivar looks to us just like the flower, you know, pretty much on the native version of that plant. But when a butterfly flies over and sees it, they're not seeing that ultraviolet light reflecting off of there that kind of a lot of uh, flowers like that, the petals show up in the ultraviolet and it kind of, you know, shows up like a little landing pad for those insects and they know I need to go right there to find mm -hmm. the nectar I want. And so that um, trait has been bred out of some of these plants. And so, you know, that's another reason why natives, um, you know, are good. Okay. Well, I have one more question. Sure. Um, I, if I understood right, you said that um, the cover for the bird should be about 15 feet from the bird feeder. I guess I, for some reason, I thought that the birds would need the cover right close to the bird feeder so that if something came after them while they were eating, they could, you know, zoom over really quickly. What, um, What's wrong with that thinking? Well, because if it's if it's closer than if it's too close, then predators can hide in that cover. Okay. Oh, I never thought of that. And so, okay. like, like, uh, well, okay, like my neighbor has a cat, and they let him roam the neighborhood, and he loves my backyard. You know, it's like I part of my backyard is planted with uh, tall grass prairie plants and he likes to prowl around back there just like he's a little panther but uh, you know he'll come up and like lay there in the cover near my feeding station and watch those birds you know birds can move pretty fast and so that covers far enough away that if that cat tries to spring out there they can get away before the the cat can get there and, uh, but likewise, I mean, uh, one uh, big predator that you see more and more in the urban environment around your feeding stations and stuff are uh, Cooper's hawks. And they're a hawk that prey primarily on other, on songbirds. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, that's the kind of thing where, um, you know, like I have a lot of big trees in my backyard, but they're far enough away that if a cooper's hawk comes and he perches up there, uh, 
that by the time he goes into his dive to try and get down to where my birds are, they still have enough time to zip over there, uh, you know, to uh, like the choke cherry tree that's 15 mm -hmm. feet away from my feeding station and, and, and evade him, you know. So that's okay. why you don't want to have it too close, but, um, you know. And would that be the same then with the bird bath, that it should be right. a little further away from the feeding? Yeah, same right. deal, because, you know, birds, uh, um, you know, um, like, particularly when they're, when they're bathing in the, you know, it's like, like I was talking about that robin. I mean, when he gets in that bird bath, he's just off in a world of his own, just splashing around in there and having a great time. It's like, oh, yeah, if I was a Cooper's hawk, I'd be like, ah, there's dinner, you know, but, uh, you know, there's, there's cover close by, so if uh, that, uh, uh, predator tried to catch him there. He's still got time to escape. Okay. Well, thank you. And Kevin, you've done a great job. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Oh, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. You know, I could go on and on forever about gardening and birds. Uh, you know, it's something uh, kind of a passion of mine. I love it. And this has been just a great time of year this year for, you know, having lots of birds in the garden. Um, I think with uh, people being isolated here the past few months that the birds are out a lot more and singing a lot more. And um, so, you know, it just shows you that uh, the impact we humans can have on the environment. And, you know, if we were a little less uh, um, impactful, we might uh, have a lot more of our bird friends to share the world with. Um, I have w another um, little comment from the chat box. Carolyn says, squirrels will not eat safflower seeds. So if your squirrels eat from your bird feeders, try safflower seeds. Yeah, she's right about that. You know, I have, uh, I have some, uh, like I said, I feel a lot of safflower and, and black oil sunflower seed. And, uh, but the, the uh, the feeders with the sunflower seed in them are positioned to where it's where the squirrels can't get to them okay um, and so like for a long time I wasn't hardly seeing any squirrels around my feeder even though there'd be a little bit of sunflower seeds that would you know fall uh, usually the birds would get to it uh, um, and there was other stuff for the squirrels to eat, but now that the squirrels, uh, you know, uh, have their young squirrel families that they're out there searching for food for, I've been seeing a lot more squirrels around my feeding station, these little, you know, young squirrels out there frolicking around, but yeah, uh, they, they don't eat some, uh, you know, I, I mean, I guess they don't like the taste of safflower seed because I can't imagine that they couldn't crack them open, but they don't eat those safflower seed. They'll sit there in that platform feeder and it'll be all full of safflower seeds and there'll be a few uh, sunflower seeds in there and they'll sit there and rummage through there and pick out those sunflower seeds and eat them. Well, do we have any more questions? One more comment. <clears throat> Ariel had to leave a little early for another webinar, but she said, we are so lucky to have you as a master gardener. <laughs> well, that's very nice of her to say, uh, you know, it's something I really enjoy. So, um, you know, um, I mean, that's what, you know, they always tell you, it's like when you're trying to find something to do in, in life, uh, find something that you love to do, and then it's not really work, right? <laughs> that's kind of how I feel about Master Gardening. So, uh, 
Well, we got a couple more webinars in this series coming up, and they're both going to be good ones. I can't remember what the next one is, but I'm anxious to listen to check out the one about the native bees. Yeah. Oh, I know. The next one is aerials on uh, on uh, plants nuisance issues. Um. Well, Jackie Tan Kabelik is going to. Um present managing urban wildlife. Oh, she is. Oh, mm -hmm. great. Well, she did a wonderful job on that, uh, that uh, uh, designing uh, for wildlife habitat, uh, one right before mine. Oh, I just enjoyed that so much. Yes. And then we'll have Dr. Daphne Mays come. She's a Xerces Society outreach ambassador and she's going to talk to us about kansas native bees in two weeks so oh that's going to be awesome mm -hmm. and it's like man you know if you want to know about pollinators and attracting pollinators xerxes society it's just like you know i could go to their website and spend the whole day there you know and not run out of you know, new stuff to find. It's just, they're such a wealth of information and they do a lot of good work, uh, you know, helping to, uh, helping our pollinators out there. Well, you need to make sure you clear your calendar for the 23rd at two o'clock for Dr. Mays's presentation. Oh, but I already have. Okay, I well, already, I already have. <laughs> if there aren't any more questions, Kevin, thank you so very much. That was wonderful. And thank you all to all our participants today. Please, like Kevin was saying, join us next week at this time where Shawnee County Master Gardener Jackie Tankavelic will give her presentation, Managing Urban Wildlife. So bye-bye, everyone. Don't forget to fill out your super quick survey. All right, bye, Leslie. Bye, guys.